In 2004, a man called John Quijada uploaded a webpage of 160,000 words detailing the grammar and vocabulary of his constructed language, Ithquil. He later created a phonologically simplified version of the language in 2007, and a third version in 2011, which is the current form of Ithquil, though he announced in 2017 that he was working on a Mark IV. Natural languages are adequate, Quijada told a journalist, but that doesn't mean they're optimal. Ithquil wasn't created for use in everyday communication, and to date, no one claims to speak it fluently, including Quijada himself. It is an exercise in the extents and limitations of human language. Ithquil combines three seemingly contradictory goals. To express deeper aspects of human cognition than what is found in natural languages, to reduce semantic ambiguity as much as possible for an incredibly precise language, and then thirdly, to do all this while keeping the language morphophonologically concise. In other words, the language aims to say a lot in very few syllables. And how does Ithquil achieve this? Let's take a look at the example that Quijada himself gives on the introduction page of Ithquil.net. This phrase, which consists of two words and which I'm not going to be trying to pronounce, roughly translates to, on the contrary, I think it may turn out that this rugged mountain range trails off at some point. Taking just the first word here, we can break this down into three components. This bit means on the contrary. This bit here basically means it may turn out to be that. And this bit means at some point. You could break down the second word in much the same way, and you have all these little morphological units that carry one or two bits of meaning each to form the sentence as a whole. This language consists of root words and affixes used to specify information, leading to a very concise, very precise language. So what do I mean when I say the Ithquil fallacy? This video is not a critique of Ithquil. For the record, I think it's one of the best constructed languages of all time, and as a piece of art, it's fantastic. But what I call the Ithquil fallacy does not refer to the quality of this particular language, but to a way of thinking about language. Because some people think of any language, languages in general, as being basically less efficient versions of Ithquil. For example, the idea is that if you take this phrase in English, you can, just like in Ithquil, divide up the sentence to show where each bit of meaning is stored. Sometimes we have several pieces of meaning stored within a single morpheme, like in the Spanish habla, where this morpheme is a stem from the infinitive hablar, meaning to speak, and this a morpheme conveys that this is singular, third person, indicative, and present all at once. He speaks, or she speaks, all in all. But at the end of the day, different morphemes and part of speech are used to convey one or more bits of meaning to the listener. Where no meaning is being added, like with grammatical gender, or information is repeated, like where a plural form is denoted with both an article and an inflection of the noun, this is seen as a mistake, a human error, something that went wrong in the development of the language. I don't want to say that this view is stupid, because I think it's something we naturally tend towards when learning a new language. I mean, why add plural adjective endings when you already know the noun is plural Spanish and German? Why are you conjugating your verbs by person when pronouns are already compulsory? I mean, alright, I get that we have Z and Z, meaning she and they, and they're only differentiated by verb conjugation. So, Z hat means she has, and Z haben means they have. So, we can keep that verb conjugation for they, the plural Z, but all those others can go. Why bother with them? We still know what's being said just by the pronoun. And, well, I think this is an example of the Ithquil fallacy. I'm not saying that those verb conjugations by person are necessary, plenty of languages work just fine without them, nor am I saying that they add any meaning, but things don't have to add meaning to be useful to some degree. Let me show you what I mean with a little experiment I conducted with the excellent people over on the Kleins Community Discord server invite link in the description. Verbs in the German present tense are more conjugated than those in English. Take the verbs will and can, which are invariable in the present, and what we could broadly consider to be their German counterparts, können and werden. Sure, these German words have a lot of unnecessary information at the end of the verb stem, but which of these languages do you think it would be easier to hear in a high noise environment? I tried to simulate such an environment by highly corrupting audio files of a text-to-speech voice reading out English pronoun-verb pairings in one condition, and German pronoun-verb pairings in the other. Participants were given three audio files, and asked to play each one only once. The first consisted of ten phrases with the verb can, or können, 
the second 10 phrases with will or werden, and the third with 15 mixed phrases. For all files, participants were asked to write down the subject pronoun being used in each phrase. And sure enough, the German speakers found this a lot easier than the English ones. And I mean a lot. The average score out of 35 for English speakers was just over 8, whilst it was over 28 for German speakers. The very highest score recorded for English, 17 out of 35, was still lower than the lowest score for German, 19. Using a Man Whitney U test, we see that in spite of the small sample size, this result is significant at the 1% significance level. We can pretty safely reject the idea that comprehension of German pronouns in distorted audio is identical to that of English pronouns. My theory is that this is because of verb conjugations. In the German audio, listeners had two clues as to what the pronoun was. First, the pronoun itself, and then the conjugation at the end of the verb. Meanwhile, the English usually only had the pronoun to go by. My point here is not that German is grammatically superior to English. Having fewer conjugations by person works just fine. What I am saying is that language isn't just about meaning. Language is about communication, and meaning isn't all there is to communication. Because sometimes the room we're in is really loud, or we mishear something. Maybe these extra plural endings and verb conjugations are a product of human error, but not in the sense that they're useless and we left them in anyway, accidentally. In the sense that in many languages across the world, we've got systems to help compensate for our own errors in hearing. And I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm.